What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Locked On Pirates podcast. I am, of course, your host, Ethan Smith, who does the most, and I hope you all had a phenomenal weekend as we continue to run through the month of January. Hopefully everybody is all safe and sound with all the snow that was going all over the country here in Savannah. Nothing really happened, but hopefully you guys are all okay. And of course, on Monday, as always, we are going to be joined by the wonderful Gary Morgan Jr. as we talk about a lot of different things, actually. We're going to talk about the top 10 prospects and where they will begin the season at the varying levels of the minor league system, as well as the owner's proposal and a breakdown of that proposal in the CBA and maybe how it could be a positive light at the end of the tunnel with all the CBA negotiations and hopefully end up with fans and players and teams getting baseball. But thank you all for making me your first listen of the day every single day here on the Locked On Podcast Network where it's your team every day. You can follow this podcast on Spotify, Odyssey, Google Play, and of course YouTube where we are doing three episodes a week all off season, still getting these things out. And until the music hits, you already know it's not real. So when it does, things get real. Let's have a fun Monday, January 17th. You are Locked On Pirates, your daily Pittsburgh Pirates podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And what's going on, everyone? Welcome back to the Locked On Pirates podcast. As already mentioned, I am, of course, your host, Ethan Smith. To my right, as always, on Mondays is Gary Morgan. Gary, how are you doing? As I believe it is Live Pirates Fam Forum Week, right? Yeah, we'll be doing the live show this Saturday. Um, We're going to have our regular show on Friday as well. But, um, yeah, the live show is on Saturday at the North Shore Tavern at 2 o'clock right across from PNC Park, and we are really, really looking forward to it. A lot of giveaways. It's going to be fun. Oh, yeah, of course. And, I mean, you guys already know Gary has all kinds of things to talk about when it comes to the Pittsburgh Pirates. That's why we have him here every Monday in the middle of January. We always have something to talk about when it comes to Pittsburgh Pirates baseball. There's always something going on. And you mentioned to me uh, yesterday about the owner's proposal, and you wanted to break it down a little bit. And you actually had something on your uh, site inside the Bucks basement about it. Um, just give us a breakdown, like a pretty standard breakdown of the proposal that the owners had to the players and to the CBA. I mean, let's start at the top, right? This is a this was a punt and or a fishing exercise for um, the owners to basically gauge uh, just how um, willing the players are to compromise on some things. Mm-hmm. And they moved close enough or fur- far enough towards them to basically be able to say that, that they tried to compromise a little bit. Um, all in all, none of this is going to fix the game the way a lot of people want it to. You know, this isn't a salary cap. But I figured let's go through it. Let's talk about what, what they put in it. And uh, before we get the players' rebuttal, um, let's take the positive that they're going to give a rebuttal. Because okay. they could have easily shoved this right back across the table. Um, universal designated hitter, I think everybody knew, was going to be in this. It is. I don't see either side really opposing that. So um, I would consider this a lock to actually be yeah. in the final agreement. Increased minimum salaries, they went from 575 to 600 650 and 700 It's a tiered approach now for the first three years at least as far as their proposal goes. Um, I don't think this is much of anything, but again, this was so they could say they compromised a little bit. The uh, CBT, or as you guys know it, uh, luxury tax, they increased the threshold from $210 million to 214 For some perspective, the players wanted somewhere in the neighborhood of 248 I believe it was. Um, So there's considerable work to do there as far as uh, coming together. Expanded playoffs, 14-team playoff pool. This is really probably the the breaking point for the owners. They will not end this without that. Mm -hmm. So uh, if the players really want to get this done, 
th there won't be any opposition to increasing the playoffs. There just won't be. Um, that said, it's probably their only real bargaining chip. Uh, draft lottery for the top three picks, and they instituted uh, some new legislation where you couldn't be in the mix for the top three picks three years in a row. So basically, if your team stinks for three straight years, you will not get a top three pick three straight years if this were to go through. Keep that in mind for everything I say here. Uh, international draft is interesting to me. I didn't see any language on how it was actually uh, planned to be constructed, but it's a departure, and we just got through the international signing period, and Ethan knows I was pretty excited about some of the young yeah. kids they got. Um, that would go away and they would institute some kind of a draft system. Uh, I can't sit here and tell you whether that would be good or bad for the Pirates. I have to see how it how it's built. Yeah. Um, draft, I know the players have wanted that, though. So, you know, it's a little bit of a carrot to them. Uh, draft pick reward for playing top 100 players. I, <laughs> I don't like this. I don't understand this. I don't think this is going to do anything. To me, they should have just eliminated the Super 2. Instead, they're trying to uh, dance around the edges and keep some kind of extra year of control type thing. Uh, it was a silly proposal, if you ask me, uh, as far as that stuff goes. Um, it looks like they want to reward the teams that do use players that used to be called Super 2s with some kind of draft pick um, type... Um, I think it was a third round pick they were offering. It, again, it's just it's it's dancing around a subject that they I think easily could just be like, okay, super twos are gone, forget mm. that. But whatever, that's that's the proposal as it stands right now. The players haven't put out a timeline yet for when they're going to respond, but when they do, um, the next step really is how far did they come? We'll know yeah. right then whether we're going to play or not. Yeah, honestly, and with everything you said as well, I mean, I think you mentioned probably two or three things I think the players will be completely fine with, and that's universal DH, expanded playoff, and um, the minimum salaries. Now, I think they might ask for a little bit more on the minimum salaries, but sure. also at the end of the day, like, realistically, as long as they're getting something out of it, I think you said it correctly. I think the owners are just at this point trying to say, we did something. Like, we're doing something here. I just genuinely think, based off of what you told me, and I had read the proposal before, but you broke it down a little bit to where I could understand it more. I genuinely think the thing that is going to stop it the most is the luxury tax thing, personally. Because if they have already stated that they want it to be a set number and they only went up $4 million from that number, at some point I think you're going to have to get into the 220 threshold before you really start seeing them agree upon it but at the end of the day if that's also the last and only thing that they're disagreeing upon at I, I would assume that they could probably figure that out pretty quickly i would like right i mean that's something if, that, if that was really out. the major hang up yeah if the players come back with like a hard line thing like um say they move as much as the owners did and they come down to 240 mm -hmm. the owners are going to laugh them out yeah um the, the other side of the whole um, CBT thing is it's silly. There's only one team over it right now. There's only nine within shouting distance of it. This isn't going to affect anything, you know? So <laughs> I'm not really sure exactly why it's such a sticking point. Um, I, the players see it as a salary cap. They, they really do. And, and you can argue whether they should or shouldn't. But... They see it as a salary cap, and if there's going to be a salary cap, then there probably could and should be a floor. Yeah. And um, you can't do that unless you firm it up. And, and MLB didn't just increase this by uh, a few uh, thousand dollars. They changed the rules, too. They're talking now about like adding a 50% tax as the first level you know, of punishment, basically, for exceeding it. Now, there are teams that actively ignore that, as we sit here, like the Dodgers. Mm -hmm. They will not actively ignore that. Yeah, so MLB did something a little bit outside of, of, of what the players were even considering with that. 
So, I mean, there's a little bit more to talk about than just the, the dollar figure. Yeah, and that's, like, realistically, at the end of the day, I also think, like, as you mentioned, the fact that the players just didn't shove this across the table and say, we don't want to look at this at all, is a light at the end of the tunnel. And, I mean, I've already had some people say, oh, we're probably not getting baseball, like, until, like, July or August or whatever. It's January 17th. I mean, they still have some time. Now, at the end of the day... If we, me and Gary are doing a podcast, when I look at a schedule, if we're doing a podcast on Valentine's Day, which is on a Monday this year, on February 14th, and they still have not moved at all, then you can really start thinking about it. Because usually uh, pitchers and catchers will report two weeks before spring training is supposed to start. That's where you can start really thinking about missing baseball, I think, is around like when February starts or like the middle of February, and we still haven't moved. Now, again, this proposal, you can see the positives in it. The universal DH, expanded playoff, things that people want to see, but there's still other things that the players might come back with that the owners do not like at all. That is a very big possible thing, and that's why we're in the middle of this anyway. So yeah, for, I, those, for those out there that think it's cap or bust, um, I, I'm not. I'm going to sit here and tell you right now. This proposal doesn't smell like we're headed towards a salary cap. No. Um, but the reason I say pay really close attention to what the players come back with is because if they come back and they're ridiculous about it, don't be shocked if the if the owners don't go nuclear here. Because uh, Ethan's right. Yeah, you don't really have to start worrying too much about losing baseball until you get into February a little bit. But if that proposal comes back and it's got almost no movement and or it's something that the owners deem crazy, I wouldn't be shocked if we if we really, really start talking about losing baseball. Besides the fact that you don't do a lockout unless you plan to use that leverage. And that leverage is missing baseball games. So until they've actually like come up against a wall of losing baseball games... Why did they do the lockout? Yeah. So it tells me the plan all along was really to take it right up to the edge. Yeah, and I mean, hey, at this point, it's almost becoming like reality TV when you cover it. It's like, what's going to happen next? It's like, this next week on the CBA uh, lockout, whatever you would want to call a reality TV show on, like, ABC. But realistically, that's what's going on with what the owners had to say. We'll see what the players have to say, um, and then at the end of the day, it's really going to end up being people picking sides, and I'm not going to pick sides because I don't do that when it comes to this. But before we move on to the next part of our episode, I want to let everybody know that today's episode, of course, is brought to you by the best built bar or best protein bars on the planet. I would hope built bars are the best built bars on the planet, but built bar, of course, is the best tasting protein bar on the planet. They are phenomenal for you. They're a great New Year's resolution to take on. They are healthy for you. 100% covered in chocolate, have nine different flavors. If you want to try those nine different flavors, make sure you get a mix box where you get two of each of the nine different flavors of built bars that you can try and at the end of the day you know they're really good for you you can't go wrong with them but make sure before you go to builtbar.com that you use promo code locked on and you'll get 15 percent off of the best protein bars on the planet do not go eat those chalky you know like no chocolate no nothing it's just straight protein bars make sure you eat something good that you're going to feel good about today at builtbar.com now of course you already did mention a minimum salary, and um, I'm still not sure about what's going on with that whole thing about the minor leagues suing the MLB over salaries. I'm not sure if that's still going on or not. I don't know. Like I saw, I barely saw it, so that's why I didn't really comment on it too much. But as we all know, with the Pittsburgh Pirates right now, biggest thing they're looking forward to is these prospects. Now, I figured we'd focus on the top ten today. Maybe either sometime later in the week or next week I can look at the rest of the system in an entire episode. But it's very interesting to see where a lot of these guys are going to start the season Um, because a lot of them in the top ten even are going to be making impacts pretty soon here in Pittsburgh, but it might not be right away when people want it. It might not be like that. Rowenzi Contreras and O'Neal Cruz I don't think are going to start the season at the major league level. Unless they, unless something cr- like really crazy happens, um, but we'll start at number one 
because I feel like that's one that would be kind of interesting to start with, and we'll go down through 10. And Henry Davis, uh, per MLB.com right now, is slated to be a high A player. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think he'll start in high A, and I don't think he'll spend very much time there. He'll he'll finish the year in Altoona, I think, and uh, I don't think he's going to have too much trouble doing so. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with that as well. I think he'll start uh, in Greensboro just to kind of get his feet under him, and then he'll probably, I would assume, be the starting catcher in Altoona, right? I mean, I would see why. You can assume be. that he'll be the starting catcher everywhere he goes yeah, until he... <laughs> Until he deems he's not capable of it. Being the number one prospect in the system, yes, I would probably hope so. Uh, And then Quinn Priester, also here on MLB.com, has him listed as a potential high-A player. That one I disagree with. I think he'll start in Altoona. I really do. Everything points to him starting in Altoona. He, He didn't have a spectacular season last year, but he did enough. And... They need to uh, keep him moving forward. And I I believe uh, Altoona is the next logical step for him. Yeah, and I also, the one thing I wanted to bring up about Priester as well is I haven't talked about him a lot in a while, um, but you already saw, like, the decisions the Pirates had to make with 40-man roster decisions this year. Next year, guys like Quinn Priester are going to be on that kind of cuff where – Jack Sawinski and Caden Smith and Jigba and the guys that were on that 40-man slot were this year, you're really going to have to think about probably putting him on the 40-man roster at the end of 2022, I would think. I I mean, there's a real possibility you're going to have to do this with a couple guys that I'm going to mention here. Of course, the third guy, uh, O'Neal Cruz, who we got to see at the end of the season last year, as I kind of already mentioned, I think he'll start in AAA for a couple months, depending on what they want to do with him. Um, and then, of course, he'll come up to the MLB level at some point. I think he has a shot to start in Major League uh, only because of the designated hitter. Yeah, that can Uh, change things. I think they they have to have uh, some kind of a threat to to play designated hitter for for them, and uh, his bat is probably the biggest concern. that You want to make sure that he is recognizing the off-speed I could see him getting some time in AAA, but I could see him winning a job in spring if there is a spring, which there definitely would be, even if it's in early summer. Yeah, summer training 2022. That'd be very interesting. Um, Nick Gonzalez. uh, I can already tell you that based off of where MLB has him slated, that will definitely be wrong. They have him slated at high A. Uh, I think he starts the year in Altoona, more than likely alongside Leo Verpiguero, who is number five. Um, of course, Figuero is on the 40-man roster, though, so that'll probably change a little bit of how they think of him. But I've even said this ever since I saw them play together in Greensboro last year. I want them to play together at each level of the system just to gain chemistry, but also I think Piguero will probably take over him at some point. Uh, but what are your thoughts on Gonzalez and Piguero and where we could see them move around this year? I think they'll both start in Altoona. Um, I don't think that they care one way or another whether they play together every step of the way. And I don't think that they're competing with each other as far as who's going to get there first. Uh, Piguero is just a numbers game. His, his year came up to be protected. And it's really hard to make the decision to not protect a top 100 guy. So had to protect him you know i don't think it says that he's ahead of nick gonzalez in fact i think it's probably the opposite but i think they'll both start in altoona so just going through the first five if you are listening and how we've been predicting this this altoona curve team is going to be absolutely nuts (laughs) there's going to be a lot of players on this altoona curve team you're gonna have like literally the top five guys that we mentioned outside of o'neill cruz so four out of your top five prospects me and Gary believe are going to and will probably start at double A. And then, of course, we have Roenzi Contreras, of course, st- had a start at the end of the year last year. I think, again, same thing I said about Cruz. I think he'll start in triple A unless spring is really good for him and then come up at some point uh, and have like kind of like a full season. I think even if spring was good for him, he's probably going to start in triple A. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I mean, pitchers you just have to be more careful with. Uh, you, you know, it's it's one thing to have a, a hitter come up and, you know, struggle to recognize a curveball and, and take some bad swings and strike out a few times. It's another thing to have a pitcher come up and somebody you really care about and watch them get shelled for six weeks before you send them back down. I mean, it can do a lot of damage to a guy. Um, Rwanzi, out of most of the people that we observe in the system, though, seems to have a great head on his shoulders, so... I, I don't know. Maybe maybe he is somebody that could win out of spring. My gut says he'll start in AAA, though. And the thing is, too, as we mentioned this last week, about the amount of options that the Pirates do have at pitcher this year. So that could also be a factor into why Rowenzi could, you know, be in AAA for a hot minute before we see him again. Now, these next two, of course, were alongside with Henry Davis in the draft class. This, of course, is brought to you by MLB.com Prospects, so this is like their list. Uh, Anthony Solometto and Bubba Chandler. At the at the end of the day, I mean, whatever we predict here doesn't really matter. Uh, they just got drafted last year, and I would say they would probably be, would it be rookie ball or low A before yeah, high I, A? I would expect both to be low A. Yeah. Uh, Bubba Chandler, mostly because they don't even know what they're doing with him yet. Yeah. I mean, I I think he, they, they've promised him he can continue to pursue pitching and playing, um, you know, in the field. And I believe that they'll let him do that for a season at low A minimally and get his legs under him and figure out what they want to do moving forward. Maybe he'll actually be a successful two-way player. Who knows? Um I, I think Salamedo, he's raw. He's still raw. Um, I do like some of what I'm seeing like in, in his Instagram posts as far as uh, his pitching mechanics go and everything, but he's a low-A player. He's a project, always mm-hmm. is going to be a project. That's what he is. Yeah, um, so if you had to choose, and I know like right now it's very early and this could be like an early prediction, but from what you've seen from Bubba Chandler in the past – would you rather have him as a pitcher or a hitter down the line, or is it like again? It's it's very early to suggest anything, but yeah, I mean, he's talented either way. Um, I think we just need to let his play speak to what he ultimately is. Uh, he's got some impressive tools on the mound. I'm not going to sit here and say he doesn't, mm-hmm. but most of it's velocity rated, and the velocity is not so impressive that it's overwhelming where you would consider taking him out of the field, especially when his bat will play, I think. Yeah. And thank God we stole him from Clemson because I can't stand Clemson. Sorry. Uh, I love to throw that in there every time that the Pirates stole him from Clemson. Yeah, take that, Dabo. You're getting out-recruited by Derek Shelton and Ben Charrington. Um, (laughs) At the end of the uh, the top ten list, we have Carmen Majinski and – I've been a fan of him ever since I've seen him in the uh, ever since I've been on this podcast, covering this podcast and everything. And they have him listed at AAA right now and a 2023 ETA. I, I mean, again, could he be another guy that starts in Altoona and then makes that jump later in the year, or is it a guy? Or could he just be in AAA already? I personally feel he'll start in Altoona, but. Um... If any one of the pitchers is going to make that jump, it's him or Michael Burrows. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think uh, better safe than sorry. I'd probably start him in Double A. Gotta love that. And I mean, you got also mentioned Michael Burrows. They had him listed uh, at High A, but I also believe that was the level that they were at at the end of the year. So I mean, that's. But again, all of that is going to shift around. All of that is going to move around all year. And rightfully so. I mean, I think a lot more people, especially listeners of this podcast, should be watching this stuff. Because if you really want to get a gauge on who the best players are going to be, and as me and Gary already predicted, go watch Altoona play some games, man, this year. Because yeah, if you want. It's going to be largely what Greensboro was last year. Yep. And it's, uh, it's definitely where you can see the future now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Indianapolis is not going to be a graveyard this year, though. Thank and God. I, and I do think that they're going to be pretty liberal with moving players up uh, to AAA um, from AA. I think we're going to see a lot of movement midseason. And a lot of that is because those ETAs on some of those pitchers like Majinski and, and Quinn Priester, 
they're listing them at 2023 and I don't see that as unrealistic. They, mm-hmm. they like Majinski in particular, very, very evolved. His stuff is very real. Problem is he just has not pitched much. So I think double A is a good place to start somebody like that. Let him oh, yeah. really work through. And I can't wait until he gets to the major league level and we get to hear uh, commentators consistently mess up his name. I, I'm, I'm finding out all the different ways that you could say it to where they're going to mess it up. Um, but again, also, uh, way ahead of time as well, if you guys want to watch these games, MILB.TV, of course, is a great subscription service for all of that stuff. Uh, you can watch, I believe, all of them, like, or the ones that are available. Sometimes I think single A and low A, like Bradenton and Greensboro, are only radio at times. Um but again, like if the Pirates, even if they are playing, sometimes what I'll tend to do, and I did this last year, I'll have the Pirate game on the TV and then the minor league game on the computer just to, you know, look back and forth, see what's going on. Because at the end of the day, as everybody likes to ask me, when is this team, like all the other hosts and people that I have on the show, when do you see this team contending? I'm like, well, I have to watch these games first to figure it out and see who's going to be there. Um, and at the end of the day, too, guess what? Not all of these guys are going to work out. I'm sorry. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, and before we wrap up today's episode, I do want to let everyone know about the wonderful people over at betonline.ag. Of course, betonline.ag has you covered with all of the betting lines that you need for the NFL playoffs. Hopefully, everybody bet Chiefs plus or uh, minus 13 yesterday. Uh, yeah. Um, hopefully you bet a lot of other things too, like Niners pl- uh, plus three, because I called that three weeks ago. I said that if the Niners end up playing the Cowboys in the playoffs, they're going to beat them. And I had no gripes about it at all. Uh, but you don't have to only bet on the NFL. You can bet on the NHL and the Pittsburgh Penguins, the NBA and the Cleveland Cavaliers, UFC, and even play your favorite Vegas casino games. Just make sure you use the promo code Locked On to receive your 50% welcome bonus on betonline.ag, and that's where the game starts. Now, uh, wrapping up today's episode, Gary, I wanted you to go ahead and talk about the uh, live fan forum just a little bit more uh, since this is the last time you'll be on with me before you actually have it and let people know where they have to be, what kind of questions you guys are expecting, and how it's going to be for you. I mean, we're going to try to keep it down to two topics because we want to give everybody a chance to participate. So um, the main questions are... Everything about the Pittsburgh Pirates tells you that you should not waste your time being a fan. Why the hell are you still? So yeah. I want to hear people give us their reasoning for, for why they've stuck by this organization as long as they have. And uh, the other one is just literally going to be ask us anything. So nice. I think it's going to be a good time and really looking forward to as many people participating as possible. Well, why am I still a fan? I'll go ahead and answer your first question is because, uh, one, I do this podcast, and two, I've been a fan of baseball for so long because it's the sport that I primarily played as a kid, and at the end of the day, when your like, whole family is from Pittsburgh, I'm not going to go sit here and root for another team. It's just not how I am. Because, like, growing up down here, because I grew up in Georgia. I was born in Pittsburgh, but I grew up down here. I could have easily been a Braves fan or a Yankees fan or a Dodgers fan. Or I could have easily been a Falcons, Panthers, Jags, Bucks fan. I could have been any of that. But then I was like, you know what? I'm going to stick to the city. And, you know, thank God I didn't choose the Atlanta hockey team at the time because then I would have been really in a rut. Uh, But when it comes back to the Pirates, too, again, from the limited sample size of watching this team, because I've watched it since 2008, I believe. So, I mean, I'm on my 15th year of being a Pirates fan. And the limited sample size, this is probably the most optimistic I've felt in a long time. Uh, And, again, hopefully that optimism doesn't come back to bite me in the ass like it usually does. Uh, But we'll see. And at the end of the day, you never know. Maybe Ben Charrington finally figures it out. I have no idea. But that's why I'm a fan of this team still. That's fair. And you said ask you anything, right? Yep. So what do you have coming up on Inside the Bucks Basement? There's my question. Uh, Every Monday, just like the appearance on here, I have the uh, five thoughts at five that that come up at five o'clock, oddly enough. And uh, we, we kind of kick off every week with uh, five things that are floating around in my noggin and talk about them. Awesome. Well, yeah, hopefully you guys listen to this episode first. 
I'm sure Gary will probably relay some of the ideas that we talked about on here today on his uh, Five Thoughts at Five. But, guys, thank you all so much for tuning in on Monday, January 17th. Happy MLK Day to anybody uh, who is listening that may be at any of the parades. I don't know if there are really any going on. I know the one in Savannah got canceled, which was a really big deal. But hopefully you all have a wonderful extra day off if you get that extra day off. I don't. I have to be at work. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is the Pittsburgh Pirates podcast. We're still here all off season. I am your host, Ethan Smith. That is Gary Morgan. And hopefully you all have a wonderful rest of your Monday.